Hi, welcome and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, President Dave Newkirk is stuck in traffic, so I'm Mel Hartley, Vice President of the School Board, and therefore I am filling in now for Dave. So tonight's community conversation is all about critical thinkers and solution seekers. Um, so we have lots of folks here with us tonight from our community, all of our community partners. We thank you all for your participation with the school district. And I'm going to let them um, take just a brief amount of time and introduce themselves and um, where they're from. Go ahead. Uh, Chris Woods, uh, CEO of Boys and Girls Club here in Thurston County. Okay. Good evening. I'm Jen Burbage, Parks and Recreation Director for the City of Lacey. And I'm Kevin Reimer, and I'm the Director of Activities and Athletics and Arts here for North Thurston Public Schools. I'm Chris Shackley, and I'm from Thurston County 4-H. Megan Sullivan, Executive Director of Together. We're a public health nonprofit that partners with the district on before and after school and summer programs. And I'm Patrick Costello. I'm the Executive Director of Youth and Community Development with the South Sound Y. Thank you all for spending your evening and coming uh, to share your information with us. So now we're going to do the moderated panel. We have a series of questions. Um, Troy over here is our timekeeper, so he will give you a one minute to let you know your time is halfway up, and then the two minutes to let you know that your time is up. So at that point, we would ask that you wrap up your question, just because we respect all your time and yours as well, um, and we want to make sure we try to keep to the agenda. Okay, so we are going to, uh, since we started introductions at this end, I'm going to start down there um, with Patrick Costello from the YMCA. How has your organization supported youth in either school or community-based activities? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so we run a lot of different youth-oriented programs. Um, both for schools and in the communities. Um, at all of, or not all of, but at the majority of elementary schools in the area, we operate a before and after school program called YCARE. Um, it's a safe place for kids, and we serve about four to 500 kids here in North Thurston. Um, we also operate a really robust youth sports league with a main focus on character development. Um, it's one of the leagues that um, both young kids and teens can participate in without worry of tryouts or anything. Everyone's welcome. So there's a, a wide variety of skill set there. Um, and then we also run a lot of programs designed to really close the achievement gap. Um, the name or the, the flagship program that we operate there is called Power Scholars. Um, we operate it here and in Olympia. We've operated in Tumwater as well. And uh, that's a free to families program, um, really designed for kids that are both uh, behind grade level and um, are, are low income. Um, so really targeting those families in terms of helping close, their, close that achievement gap. Um, we operate some other smaller kind of um, niche programs as well, um, like youth in government is one that's really popular at the statewide level. Um, our delegation here is smaller than we think it could be. And uh, we're continuing to imagine new programs, but really all of them are designed around healthy living, social responsibility, and youth development. Okay, thank you. I know many of the board members were able to go um, observe the Power Scholars program this summer, and the energy and the positivity were really very cool. Um, Megan Sullivan from Together, please uh, again describe how you support youth in either school or community-based activities. Together is 30 years old, and for all of our 30 years, we've partnered with Northwestern Public Schools, so we have a long history of partnership. Over the last six years, we've partnered on Clubhouse before and after school programs and also summer programs. For the first five years, that was a partnership in three elementary schools that were um, higher need in terms of both academics and um, free and reduced lunch, so lower income um, schools. And then in the last year, we added uh, two middle schools to that. And this year we're in four schools because of some changes to the main funding, which is state funding. But that before and after school and summer program um, work is really project-based learning. So it's an opportunity for kids to try their hand at things like robotics or um, 
partner, we partner with um, organizations that are like engineering firms that will come in and um, have their young professionals um, roll up their sleeves and build bridges out of popsicle sticks and um, do some applied learning. There's a large emphasis on student choice and student voice, so centering um, young people in making decisions about what they want to learn about and how they want to learn. And something that we're really proud of and excited about is over the last two years, we've built a dual language, two-way um, bilingual program in Spanish and English, starting at Lydia Hawk Elementary and also extending to our Chinook Middle School program. So that's something that we're really excited about. One thing that's been great about the way that we do business is um, robust partnerships are part of how we do that. So we've had lots of conversations with partners at this table, like the Y and Boys and Girls Club and many, many others. Um, to make sure that more kids are served um, through the variety of programs that they offer and we offer. Thank you, and congratulations on the big new grant. I know Together is doing wonderful things. Thank you. Okay. Chris Shackley from Thurston County 4-H. Again, the same question, how your organization supports youth in either school or community-based activities? Well, just in the general community, we have many, many clubs, um, many projects, not just livestock and animals, but STEM, arts and crafts, baking, um, that are available to every child, no matter, you know, what their demographics or where they live or, you know, if money, if, if you can't afford to join 4-H, we make sure that they have the money, you know, that we give them the money so that they can join 4-H. Um, so we have that. Um, we've worked with the community, we, we've worked with the Y and together in some of the after school programs that they have. We've done healthy living uh, programs with both of them. Um, we are currently doing a, a robotics after school club at a private school. Um, and I work with two teenage boys that are uh, attend North Thurston High School in the robotics club. And so I, you know, I, I always like to have teens work with me and help me, or I help them. <laughs> um, we work uh, down in Rochester doing healthy living type after school programs and STEM programs. So, uh, and we're always, always open to do after school programs with other, um, other organizations. We also have a great number of curriculum and STEM kits available to, you know, like Y has borrowed our robotics kits and other programs and, you know, so that's available to the pub, to the community, the schools. So um, that's kind of what 4-H is. Awesome. Thank you. Our own Kevin Reimer from North Thurston Public Schools. So uh, I would say that what we offer is we offer opportunities, and we do that through sports and athletics. We do it through music. We do it through theater. We do academic clubs. We do other clubs and activities uh, that just offer opportunities for students. Um, in athletics, our high schools are, there's 23 high school teams at each school, uh, three sports seasons, 200 to 300 athletes uh, each season on average turn out. Um, at the middle school for 7th and 8th graders, there's 10 teams, 4 seasons, uh, six, 60 to 120 kids per season turn out, plus intramurals, uh, mainly for 6th graders. There's basketball, volleyball. Uh, at the elementary, we do track as well, as far as athletics go in the music realm of things. In elementary, there's choirs uh, that are after school and before school. Uh, middle school, the same with orchestras, jazz bands, percussion bands. Um, pep bands at the high school, jazz bands, marching bands, uh, theater with uh, uh, different, each high school has three performances per year. Uh, middle schools vary a little bit on that. Uh, elementary, we partner like with South Bay Elementary School with the PTA, offers um, a, a, a play after school that they put together as well in the academic clubs of STEMs, robotics, coding, literature, creative writing, um, and other clubs um, across the board. Our elementary schools had about 90 clubs last year going on. Middle school had approximately 36, and high schools had about 100 clubs total. So. All right. Thank you. Jen Burbridge from Parks and Rec. 
Okay. Well, thanks for the opportunity. And really quickly, I'd like to thank the North, North Thurston Public Schools for their ongoing partnership and also uh, the organizations at this table as well for their partnerships that we currently have. Um, the city of Lacey has had a joint use agreement with North Thurston Public Schools for right around 45 years now. Um, so it's a long going partnership and the city use, utilizes this, uh, the school district facilities for a lot of our community based programs. We also use our own city facilities and then um, we have just under 1200 acres of park, public park space um, that various programs will also take place at. Um, but as far as to answer the question, how we support youth and um, youth and teens, uh, we're primarily, well, in the schools for the programs, but we're very much community-based. Um, in a nutshell, we have programs, events, job experience, and volunteer experience to offer youth and teens um, regarding, so in the program area, sports, aquatics, fitness, music, dance, day camps, teen camps, trips and tours, and we have a museum which we're beefing up our educational opportunities there. Um, events such as activity nights at the middle schools, we have a polar plunge, cultural celebration, Lacey Spring Fun Fair, STEM Fair, uh, 3rd of July fireworks spectacular, uh, Lacey and Tune concert series, dances, movie nights, Arbor Day, Earth Day, National Trails Day, Children's Day, etc. cetera. Um, there's a few more. With job re experience, um, we offer lifeguard swim instructors, um, day camp leaders, facility attendants, event staff, sports staff, et cetera. Um, this is something that kids can put on their resume. They can get a letter of recommendation from our staff uh, for a job well done and to help them lead to other opportunities. And then in the area of volunteer, um, we have a teen leadership group. We have counselor and training program for day camp. Um, we do offer work parties in the parks. Uh, we have a youth historical commissioner uh, every year and now can run, uh, can actually have a two-year term, a youth park board commissioner. And then the newest thing is the city of Lacey is having a youth, youth council um, here shortly to mirror and be mentored by our city council members. Okay, excellent, thank you. Chris Woods from Boys and Girls Club, same question. Thanks, Mel. Uh, Boys and Girls Club is uh, fairly new. Uh, when you look at all the services that we have available to us in Thurston County, we've been here since 2001, currently serving over 3,000 students in six school districts in the county. Uh, that includes North Thurston, Olympia, Rochester, Tenino, Tumwater, and we just started in Yelm. Uh, we're currently uh, operating seven clubs in those six districts. We have about 60 staff and about 100 volunteers in all of our clubs. And our goal is pretty simple. It's really to provide safe and productive before and after school opportunities for uh, children from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. And we do this by focusing on really three essential areas, academic success being the first, and our educational programs support members' success in school and prepare them for graduation and beyond. And uh, really our goal there is to be an extension of the school, an extension of the district so that if a school and a district had more time with students, what would they like to do? And, and we like to consider ourselves an extension of that process and help them to get across the stage. Second area is good character and citizenship. Uh, club members learn by example and experience to become thoughtful, kind, and responsible youth through a variety of programs. And then healthy lifestyles would be our third goal, and that's to support members' lifelong health uh, through offering nutritious snacks and meals, and hands-on gardening and cooking classes and games and so on. And uh, we're looking to uh, continue to, to grow in the community and be able to provide more opportunities for more youth um, in the districts that we serve. Wonderful, thank you. So um, two things, one, our board members are elected officials, um, but it's a non-paid position, so we're often running up and down I-5 to get here after work. So with that, our president, Dave Newkirk, has arrived. Um, and I also see the mayor of Lacey in the back there. Andy, thank you for being with us today. Andy Greider. So Mr. Newkirk, would you like to come up and start him off on question number two? Sure. Tell me where I'm supposed to be. Thank you, there Mel. You <laughs> so question number two is, what are some of the challenges or opportunities for promoting youth and teen participation? So why don't we start back here with um, Chris as well? Sure. 
Uh, I think you're probably going to hear some common themes as we go down the road here, but um, for us, uh, resources um, is one of the biggest uh, challenges, and I'll, I'll stick to challenges first. Um, it, it, we are entirely dependent upon fundraising, individual donors, corporate donors, and um, we're only limited by the space we have to use to serve our youth and the amount of money we have uh, to hire staff and to offer scholarships to our youth. Uh, I think we can be more efficient in collaboration and planning our services, and this is a fantastic start, and I think this is uh, something that we should be doing in, in all of our school districts. Um, we're limited by space as it relates to transportation. You know, our school districts are great partners in transporting kids, but when you have a full bus, it's hard to bring more kids than, than you're allowed to carry. And then teen retention is a big one, teen retention in our clubs, and we know that's the most at-risk group right now, and so we gotta find ways to uh, retain uh, our teens and provide uh, positive places for them. As far as opportunities, uh, continue to have opportunities to partner with Northeastern Public Schools to serve uh, many of our homeless students and families, and uh, creating dedicated space at our Lacey Club to serve kindergartners. We started uh, a kindergarten through second grade club at Lacey Elementary School this year. Um, working with North Thurston to finalize installation of a portable at our club to separate and have two different teens, uh, teen groups, one for middle school and one for high school. Um, contrary to popular belief, they don't necessarily want to be hanging out together. Um, in case you didn't know that, middle schoolers and high schoolers like to have their own space. And then um, also working on having a club on the same campus as the Family Youth Resource Center that just opened and looking for ways to partner. Uh, with them. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Ms. Burbage, same question. Some uh, challenges or opportunities for promoting youth and teen participation? Okay. Um, challenges and opportunities uh, from our standpoint, and I think Chris is right. There's going to be some uh, repetitive information here from the panel, um, but really finding out what youth and teens want to participate in. Um, another one is getting the word out uh, properly. So we have a lot of opportunities, but sometimes not a great response on some items versus another, and we just need to figure out, you know, how to how to really um, get that communication and marketing out, and then providing accessible opportunities is a challenge for us. Um, as a lot of you know, that have kids in sports and other programs, you're often having to drive across town in a lot of traffic, and so um, we want to be mindful of, you know, having accessible opportunities for people that are close to home. Um, and then providing affordable opportunities, so resources is another challenge, definitely. And then also sec uh, securing enough uh, facility space to offer the programs that we want to offer for the demand that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Reimer? I think I'll start with some extra opportunities um, versus getting to the challenges that might be a repeat. Uh, We've, one of the things the district did a couple years ago was, was add $8,000 in for opportunities for more clubs for each school to have to put stipends towards teachers to create new things. Um, and we've, we've done a, a really a pretty good job and it's growing to making sure that we spend all of that in each group. Uh, and some of those clubs then become uh, the things from the language clubs uh, to songwriters clubs to the k-pop club or whatever it may be but some some more opportunities for students so the district provided that um, financially um, as well as the opportunities that the ntef the partnerships with us so that we can provide those things for students that can't um, afford the pay to play in athletics and things like that um, is a is just a, a big opportunity for us to have um, as far as the challenges, transportation uh, is probably our biggest challenge to, to offer things. And not only um, even in our world of athletics right now, transportation um, is difficult just to have enough buses to and bus drivers to, to get us to games, let alone then those roadblocks that might stop some people from being able to stay after school because they don't have transportation to get home, um, as well as field use and um, just the overuse uh, that we have, that we have to take time to shut some fields down and that impacts the city um, as well as some of our teams and stuff like that. Uh, just 
because there are so many kids and so many, we want to keep offering as many opportunities as we can, but keeping those things accessible. And then I think with coaches and the leaders of clubs, that the, the biggest thing becomes uh, keeping coaches and keeping leaders and getting teachers, say at an elementary school, that they already have a full-time job. We want you know, to offer more opportunities for kids, but some of them, um, uh, they have a full-time job already. And so as much as I like to think everybody wants to do more and more and more, not everybody can do more. So there's a people shortage sometimes as well. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Mr. Reimer. Uh, Ms. Shackley. So 4-H is a run by volunteers, essentially. So we can have as many kids sign up, for enroll in 4-H, but if we don't have the volunteers to run our clubs, then, you know, we can't, we can't, you know, have all of these kids. So, for example, one of our clubs has 30-plus kids because she's the on only club leader that offers certain projects. So I think that's the biggest, one of the biggest challenges that we have is just finding volunteers to meet all of the kids' needs. Um, another challenge is keeping our teens. We, WSU has done a huge study in the last couple of years about how, what teens want and how they want to be communicated with and, you know, how, how we keep their interest. And so that's um, something that we're really working on right now is, is is keeping, you know, from 12 up. 4-H uh, is for kids ages 5 to 19 or 18, depending on where, you know, where in the year their birthday falls. And we tend to lose them at age 12. And so keeping their interest um, is, best, is best for them and best for the community. Um, opportunities, a current opportunity that we, we have right now is I'm working with Capital Mall. Um, they have a live, it's called Live 360, and so they're opening up their um, space for us to have to meet, have clubs meet there, or um, we're planning to do a STEM afternoon in January, I believe, just so that the whole, you know, anybody walking through the mall can come join us and do some STEM, some coding um, projects. So. I think that's a huge opportunity for us to reach more people in our community to say, hey, you know, 4-H is about, you know, all of, any, basically, if you're interested in something, anything, you can join 4-H, you can make it a 4-H project. So we just want the community, kids to know that and, and we want to support that for them. Is there any way to get the older students involved to volunteer for the younger students, or is that not yeah, viable? Yeah, 4-H, um, one of the big things in 4-H is that the teens, uh, once they reach teenage years, they're considered teen leaders, so they work with the younger kids, and that's the beauty of it, is, you know, so I, I raised my three girls in 4-H, and so when they were little, they looked up to the teen leaders, and then when they became teens, they became teen leaders, and now two of my girls are actually 4-H leaders, you know, so it, it's been really neat seeing that happen, you know, personally, you know, watching my kids become you know, good members of the community and, and reach out to them. Awesome. Okay, Ms. Sullivan. I think I will build on some themes that have already been established here, um, and I'll start with challenges. Um, obviously, there's more need than us. all of us across the table are collectively able to meet, um, and resources are a barrier in meeting those needs. Um, our programs serve about 250 or 300 um, young people in elementary and middle school each year at no cost, and um, part of the funding comes from state sources, and we're constrained in how we can use those funds. Um, so resources are a challenge. Transportation costs are a challenge. We partner with the district to get kids home. That's one of the um, core tenets of the way we do that um, before and after school program um, and summer program, transporting students. So that's a significant chunk of the budget. Um, one thing that's interesting is that our programs, while they are based at schools, are serving a higher proportion of special populations. And it does vary by school, but some schools it's a higher proportion of students who are um, utilizing special education services. Some schools it's um, lots more folks that are free and reduced lunch, which is a measure of low income status. Um, and at some schools, really a higher proportion of English language learners. So those are some challenges. Um, 
I would say the things that are working well and opportunities to build upon are partnerships. Um, we have an excellent partnership with North Thurston Public Schools and we're grateful for that. We also have convened partnership conversations with the Y and Boys and Girls Club over the last year to identify where the gaps are in service. Are there areas that aren't being served? Um, who, can, who can cover those gaps? And um, we've done great problem solving. That's worked really well. We partner with North Thurston Public Schools and Family Education and Support Services to help um, make parenting classes happen. Um, and that's something that all the partners contribute to. We're really grateful to the City of Lacey who contributes funds and North Thurston Education Foundation. We also partner with um, Parks and Rec in the summer um, around Playground Pals. So I think that the theme of opportunities is um, appreciate partners and build even stronger partnerships to serve more kids and families. Awesome, thank you. Last but not least, Mr. Costello, same question. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think there's a couple of challenges that, um, like Chris said, or just touched on uh, throughout this panel. Um, the first that jumps to mind for me, is, as was already mentioned, is resources and just access, to, particularly to um, multi-year funding for some of the programs that are most vulnerable so that we can plan and project on a year's time scale instead of every couple of months. Um, teen program, like others, is kind of where we've seen um, enrollment drop off and um, creating really fun and engaging programs that kids want to be at and want to tell their friends about. Um, I think what we're really competing with there isn't as much other activities as much as, as it is like kids being home on their phone or um, playing video games or something like that. And instead of being active and social um, and experiencing the, the life benefits of that. There's real space constraints in this area in terms of um, gym space, uh, particularly for youth sports programs, which has been challenging. And um, I, I think just being at the table with everyone here is, I think, is a good start for how we might rectify some of those things. Um, and then one thing that, um, that at least we have struggled with, particularly with our school-age childcare program, is the perception of cost and just a lack of awareness of all of the um, different financial assistance options that um, are available either through state subsidy or directly through the Y. And um, that's a little complicated because some of it is just um, teaching someone how to kind of maneuver through the, the bureaucracy and, and uh, get the funding that they need to get their kid in a program that can help them work and be a contributing member in, in the community. Awesome, thanks. I, I, I agree with you guys. I think the biggest challenge is getting away from the screens and, and, and the game times and all that and get them into activities. And, and as a parent, you know, that is a challenge no matter wh who, what you do every day. Getting your student out, getting your kid out is, is a challenge. And, and especially when we have weather problems with the rain and all that. How are you going to get a kid out in the rain, you know, instead of them playing a game inside? It's a challenge and I, I hope we can find solutions working together, but I don't think we're going to do that tonight. <laughs> Uh, moving on to our last question, we have, what are the next steps as an organization in supporting increasing the percentage of students participating in at least one positive school and community-based activity? I'm going to start with Mr. Kevin Reimer in the middle, and we'll work our way around that way this time. All right. Well, I think first is to continue strong community support that we're not going to do this alone, any of us. Um, and so in order to get this done, we need partnerships and and to keep those strong and going and look for new ways to how to help each other out. Um, I think for us to continue to get better at tracking the data to make sure that all that we're making sure we're hitting all students and we're not leaving pockets of students out. And um, so I think that's important. And I think we need to look for ways for financial support to increase as we encourage students through our goals is to increase participation, but coming with increased participation comes another JV team or another C team. And all of those things then trickle down into that's another paid person to help out. And um, the same with transportation. You know, how do we continue to, to provide those opportunities financially um, as we grow? Because if we grow, everything else proportionally grows as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Reimer. I'm going to move to his, his right. <laughs> Ms. Burbage, you're okay, up next. Thank you. Um, well, uh, one of the things that we'll be doing is more effective uh, community engagement. So our city council um, has asked us to 
the Park Board and the Parks and Recreation Department um, to do more robust uh, community engagement, maybe better digital platforms. Um, so we'll be, uh, that's one of our projects for 2020 um, that we'll be working on. And um, so that way we can find out what, you know, people really want uh, from the community. And then also um, forming partnerships, like Kevin said, of course, uh, we do have great partnerships here already with the organizations at this table, but um, just continuing to figure out ways to share resources and space um, so that we can collectively make a difference. And then securing grant funding to offset the cost of programs to make them more accessible for folks. Um, offering scholarships, uh, we are actually revamping our scholarship program. Uh, we've done the work, so we're gonna roll it out in 2020 as well. Um, and then just thinking outside the box, um, looking at ways to get kids involved, and you mentioned you know, off the video games. So um, I just went to the National Recreation and Park Association Conference in Baltimore, and uh, there was a lot of, uh, there was sessions and talk about the VR world and esports. And so just being able to be adaptable to what the trends are, and the message is, you know, if you have an open uh, gym space that you're not utilizing, which I know is hard to find, but um, go ahead and do a VR activity, which means the kids do have their, their sets on, but they're actually not on the couch at their own home. They're, they're forced to interact with other kids, and so just kind of thinking outside the box that way. And um, One of the messages at our conference also was, uh, you better start figuring out how you're going to accommodate esports, because it's coming, and... and uh, it's just, it's gonna, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, so just be ready. So oh, absolutely. The virtual reality box. is entertaining <laughs> amongst everything else. Okay, Mr. Woods, you're up, sir. I think it's been said, but it needs to be said again, increasing collaboration and planning among uh, community services to maximize participation um, with the opportunities that are currently available. And I think North Thurston is a great example of uh, leading the way, we had a, a situation at the beginning of the school year where um, the school district and the YMCA and together and Boys and Girls Clubs uh, worked all together to make sure that the schools had what they needed and that the students were gonna be taken care of and had a place to go after school. Um, we're all working with various schools and, and students in the community and so I think the district did a fantastic job of bringing us together and making sure that um, we weren't losing any, any children through the process. I think we need to survey youth to ident identify challenges and needs. I know we have a healthy youth survey, but I think we need to take some time to dig deeper with students to find out what it is um, that they need and what the challenges are, because I believe that every youth that walks through our doors and our schools are facing challenges and are hurting. And I think we need to uh, really dig deeper to find out what it is they need and how can we provide that. Continue to work with school districts to streamline information and data sharing. I think when we're able to do that, we can provide what students need in the programs outside of the school day. And again, going back to that idea of being an extension of the school day, if we had more time with our students, what would we want to do? Uh, continue to work with individual and corporate donors, grant funders, and other community partners, uh, really to generate resources long-term and not just uh, temporary. Uh, so we can serve youth and commit to programs long term. And then the last thing is uh, I think we really need to find opportunities for evening and uh, nights, particularly for our teens, um, safe places for them to go and have opportunities um, that are good choices. Great points, great points. Getting a survey done from the students is probably the best thing ever because you're, you're getting it straight from the source, right? Uh, but we need some kind of incentive for them to fill out the surveys, so that might be something we need to think of as a group as well. Um, next, we can go back to the end. Mr. Costello, same question. I'm going to read it real quick. What are the next steps as an organization in supporting increasing the percentage of students participating in at least one positive school or community-based activity? Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, just to echo everything that everyone has said so far in terms of the collaboration and partnerships. Um, I guess to provide a little bit more color in the, the ways that I've seen some of that um, happen over the last couple of months, um, the, the conversation with North Thurston, absolutely, uh, Chris, as you mentioned, it was a just completely collaborative, um, multi-organizational conversation that um, ended with us really, I think, like sending messages to all of our families in full support of the new organization that was taking over. and. Um, you know, just in the way that we all talk about each other always, just, um, you know, being 
I'm positive and assuming the best intent, of course. Um, being efficient with our efforts and not duplicative. Um, so I, I think that this could, you know, it, it could look as simple as just checking the schedule of another youth sports league and uh, making sure that yours doesn't start the same week as another one is ending. Um, but it really could, you know, go much more beyond that of reaching out and not duplicating the same sports through five different leagues around the city. I'm just using that one as an example. Um, and then in, in terms of the partnerships, I think there's a ton of opportunity there. Um, you know, with, uh, I'll, I'll use one example. Um, the Dispute Resolution Center in Olympia um, wanted to put something on for families, but they didn't have a connection to the number of um, families that we did. And so we sent it out to all of our families and kind of leveraged our, um, our base of members to get interest. And they ran a wonderful program that they're experts in. And so the more that we could do that around the table, I think, um, the more we'd be able to really meet the needs of the community. Great idea. Ms. Sullivan, you are up. I think a lot of it really has been covered. Um, I think building on the um, partnership conversations that have been going on, um, that's been really rewarding and a robust conversation for us as well over the last year. Um, helped us be able to plan um, to apply for grant funding to continue um, and expand services and then helped us as one of the big grants was ending and we were not able to continue to serve at a particular school to identify who could pick up which pieces um, and how to make sure kids were served. Um, so that was really helpful. I think um, expanded collaboration to make sure that we can get families to exactly the service that um, best meets their needs would be something that would be really neat to um, see moving forward. And then just from the um, lens of together as an organization, we do have some wait lists in some of our schools, so we're working on how to move through some of our wait lists where we have capacity. Um, and then one of our sites isn't quite full, so how to make sure we get to a point of waitlisting at that one particular site. Um, other things, um, looking at increasing access moving forward is, again, back to how do we figure out what's the absolute best service for um, each particular family. There are some um, family needs that are better served by our partners, and there are some family needs that are, are served well by us. So um, we're looking forward to continuing to partner with Northurst and then and many of the other providers here to, to meet those needs. Thanks, Ms. Olman. And last but not least, Ms. Shackley, uh, la I'll read the question one more time. What are the next steps as an organization in supporting, increasing the percentage of students participating in at least one positive school or community-based activity? Well, I think improving our communication with the community and with you know, everybody here that we are out there and available to do some programming. Um, We've talked about you know, te losing teens and what they need and what they want. And one of the things that we've um, concluded is that we need to train adult volunteers in how to work with teens specifically and, and give them the program, programming that they would like. It's nice seeing the teens and the younger kids working together, but they also like something separate. So that's something that we're working towards at, you know, as a nationwide organization and our goal by 2025 is to have 10 million kids enrolled in 4-H. So I mean, we have a big, a big job ahead of us. Yeah. Hey, you guys set goals high. That's great. Thank you all for answering the questions that we had today. Um, next we're going to move on to our next portion of this. It's the table talk. So I'm going to introduce Graham Sackerson. He's taking over from here. Thanks. Uh, one of the things uh, table talk implies conversation, and there are some people seated by themselves around the room. So maybe if you could find a table with someone else, uh, that would help the table talk. Less internal conversation. And we have... Many of you have three cards with three questions. Come on, it can't be that tough. <laughs> okay, that'll work. Anyway, we have three cards 
with three questions. I would like you to start first with the blue card. What have you learned about support structures in our community around positive school or community-based activities? Have your conversation. Uh, it's going, I'm going to give you about six minutes to have a quick conversation and jot your notes. We'll collect those cards and we'll move on to question two, so go for it. First question is, how do we get more kids involved in advisory positions and in, um, in additional activities who are not following a traditional path on um, four-year high school to college? Um, they note a lot of the kids who apply for youth positions at the city are also 4.0 students who are involved in everything. So are, do you have outreach or opportunities um, that meet the needs or the interest of all kids? Um, Ms. Shackley. Well, we have a program called Yay 4 a it's Youth Advocates for Health. And we have a program called Yay 4 h it's Youth Advocates for Health, and it's specifically for teens, and teen, um, we teach teens to be teachers. Um, they, so they help us or volunteers teach the curriculum or whatever we're teaching. For example, my two teens that are helping me with the robotics club at a private school currently, uh, we pay them a stipend for a certain amount of time that they help us. So that's an opportunity. They don't have to be, they, they can be homeschooled. They can be, you know, out of school. So we do most of this stuff after school or on the weekends. So. That's what we have available. Okay, great. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Woods. Currently, we have uh, about 25% of our staff are former club kids. And uh, so a lot of our kids will go from being a club kid to being a junior staff member in the summertime where we have programming all day long, uh, Monday through Friday. And then from there, if being a junior staff member is successful for them and for us, oftentimes those uh, youth uh, work themselves right into positions, whether it's part-time or full-time. Uh, and we found that's the best way for us to um, reach underserved youth, uh, because those are the youth that we're serving in our clubs every day. And they seem to be um, a very good fit for uh, moving into uh, positions within the organization. And many have worked on onto full-time positions and even administrative positions within the organization. Okay, great. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Megan. One thing that's worked well for us is to work to recruit and retain staff that are representative of our community and those we serve um, so that the young people see folks that look like them or experience some of the same life circumstances as them so that they really feel at home and welcomed in our um, spaces. Okay, that's great. So individuals specifically with similar um, experiences who those children can identify with. Okay, great. Anybody else? Um, I just echo the why it has tons of volunteer opportunities. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity in the summer, especially to expand our um, volunteer options for teens, um, to come and just have a, a, a mentorship experience at one of our camps even. Um, so many hands make light work. Sure. That would be really fast. Our youth and teen programming staff stay in touch with school counselors and try to connect there for opportunities. Um, but I will say that we want to do more and better outreach, and so we're open for suggestions if there's ideas out there. Thank you. Okay. Thank and you. And I have an addition. I just meant staff and volunteers. I wasn't clear, but staff and volunteers that um, are representative of our, of our community. Okay. Um, we have a series of questions, some specific, some not. Um, one, for the 4-H program, do you have to have an animal to participate? And if so, are there grants or other financial assistance for low-income families? No, you don't have to have an animal to participate. We do everything from pigs to sewing and baking. So you just, um, if kids can't afford 
to join 4-H, we do have scholarships available. Uh, a lot of clubs, if, if it, so, so for example, if a kid wants to join a hor horse club but doesn't have a horse, a lot of the volunteers work really hard to make a horse available to a child to ride and show at fair. So um, there's always ways you just have to kind of as a parent would be would just have to be honest and persistent about that. Okay, great. Um, so now this is a more general question, um, open to everyone. How has poverty limited participation for both kids and parents? Um, and how could or would more volunteers help um, with resource avoidance? Chris? I think for us, um, we serve a, a lot of uh, families that would qualify for free or reduced lunch, McKinney Vento program. Um, that's most of, of the youth that we serve, but uh, one way that's unique that we're able to serve them is a partnership with North Urson School District. In the past, uh, many of our homeless students would get on a bus after school and they would stay on that bus until the bus driver finished their regular route. And then after that, those students would be driven home. In many cases, home was temporarily outside of the city. Might have been Shelton, might have been Tacoma. So in a partnership with the school district, uh, we came up with the idea of how about if the kids are dropped off at the club right after school, they go finish their routes, and then they come back around 4.15, 4.30, and take those kids directly home. Um, that's something that's been very unique to the North Thurston School District to be able to serve those uh, those children at no cost. They come, they get to be a normal kid, they get to ha get help with their homework, they get a snack, they get to play games, they get to have fun. And all the kids at the club know is they know some kids are picked up by cars, some kids go home by the bus. Mm -hmm. And that's all they know. Uh, but that unique partnership has allowed us to uh, eliminate that barrier and serve uh, more more youth than we would normally. And transportation challenges um, were a theme in several questions. So if anybody has ideas or answers to transportation challenges, think about that one for a minute. Megan, did you have a response as well? Yeah, I just wanted to also answer how poverty is um, a barrier for access. Um, one thing I think that is distinct about our offering that I said earlier is that there isn't a fee. So I think in that sense, it's not a barrier, but there are still barriers because, again, like Chris said, a lot of the folks, some proportion of the folks we serve um, are homeless students, um, which presents a unique challenge with transportation and transportation costs. But also one thing that wasn't mentioned yet is um, mobility. So, of course, if the student wants to stay in their home district, um, the district supports that need, but sometimes folks just cannot stay where they are, and so they're building these great connections with all of these organizations. They're connected with these organizations and the adults, and then they are uprooted because you know somebody got a job in Tacoma and they're right. they're moving, and so that's hard for kids because then they're not attached to adults that they have those relationships with, and they're not attached to their their home community. Okay. Thank you. Um, more general question, how do we reach kids and families that are currently being missed? Does anybody have any ideas or any current practices that they'd like to share? Because the next set of questions are all about communication, which is probably why you're not seeing some of the kids you need to be seeing. I guess the, the one piece I would add is um, previous to, to this position, I spent 22 years in public education. And I think one thing that, that we've all learned is that we cannot expect families, all families, to come to us. And we cannot expect all families to read, listen to, or see our communication to them. So as much as possible, we need to find ways to go to the families and find out what the needs are. Um, and go to the to the youth to find out what the needs are. I don't think we can expect uh, many of those families that are uh, facing those challenges. We can't expect them to come to us. Um, similar questions that I just want to read so people know. I really am looking at all of your questions. Um, how do you get communication for opportunities and activities 
and how could we increase communication to teachers, principals, vice principals, um, especially including life skills teachers who work with our special needs students or those who don't have internet. And then the next question provides a partial answer to that, which is how can we create an infographic and get the word out, um, websites, resources, are there other options that your club has, your organization has tried or that you have found to be successful? Yellow and blue aren't questions, though. Okay. Go ahead and answer that one. Then apparently I'm being told I have to move to yellow and blue. <laughs> well, I think for, for, for 4-H, cost is a big thing, and trying to reach school districts is very difficult for us because we have to pay to advertise our programs. So if we could somehow get away from that and, you know, have a direct contact with somebody within the district or you know, something where we wouldn't have to pay for peach tree or however that works. That, that you know, for us, that's a huge thing to have, so. Okay, now we are moving on to the yellow and the blue cards. So for the yellow cards, these were, what suggestions do you have to strengthen support for positive school or community-based activities? And the question says, have these organizations considered developing a shared community calendar? which I think partners on coordinating calendars for your camps don't overlap and that sort of thing. Has there been any um, thought of a shared community calendar? There is now, right? <laughs> Everybody's shaking their head yes. Okay. Um, so for suggestions, it says, and this is more of a question rather than a, what suggestions do you have? But the suggestion is, what keeps you from designing or running your programs to be youth-led? And I think we've heard youth-led from 4-H, um, as well as growing internal mentors and advocates through Boys and Girls Club. Does anybody else um, have anything they want to add to that? Many of our clubs do come out of ASB. I mean, the, the, the student body wants, especially, um, Many times, like at the middle school especially, you'll see a group of students go to a teacher versus it's not a teacher starting the club, it's a group of students that want a club, and so they go find the teacher that they connect with to get them to start the club or be the supervisor for the club. And so a lot of things happen that way in the schools that it's not always adult down most of the time, especially in clubs, it's student student interest first, then the club becomes reality. Okay, now we're changing gears on you again because apparently the yellow cards are suggestions okay. and don't have to be read out loud. I, I would just like for you all to notice, for the public to notice that Mel was right. Okay, so back to your last two questions. I don't get to be right very often. Um, no, we're a great board. They're always awesome to work with. Okay, so we have two more questions to get before we run out of time. Um, how can the, din the district's new mentorship program collaborate with this work? We have a new mentorship program where um, it's kind of like the military liaison, only this liaison will be with businesses to try and get more career-connected learning, um, which also goes with the question, how do you keep those over 12 involved in a club or activity? Um, so do any of you have any suggestions for how the new mentorship program might collaborate with the work that your organization is doing? For us, uh, I've said a couple times about an extension of the school day and for one of the things that uh, we work with with our teens is on their high school and beyond plan which uh, many of them start at seventh grade, some are starting in ninth grade. However, uh, we see it as our responsibility to help these students get plugged into the community, whether it's an internship, volunteer opportunities, uh, again, really being an extension of the school day, trying to get these students across the stage, but not just across the graduation stage, also setting them up for success as we move forward. We found that many of our kids would be great working in the trades. We know right now that's the biggest need. They can't fill jobs. And so that mentorship, that partnership, to be able to connect our youth 
with businesses, whether it's volunteer opportunities or internships or even just mentorship, where many of these students could walk out with some sort of certification, maybe even a job, or at least some guidance on where they want to go next. Um, I could see a lot of application, especially with our, our teen centers and in each of our districts. Okay, awesome. Um, another question is, um, how do you include students with disabilities who ride the bus? Um, do we have a plan or, or do you have anything in place to help those students access the activities that you've talked about tonight? And we provide as a district, we provide transportation for everybody. Okay. Um, obviously, if I guess in some of the other questions that were before, sometimes if you don't know, and maybe that's where we have to collect, you know, better data on students to find out whether that's a hindrance and somebody hasn't asked yet. Okay. We're very fortunate in all six districts that we serve. The district provides transportation to the club, and so uh, any student with a disability would be transported to our clubs uh, by the school district, and then uh, transportation would be the responsibility of the family in the evening time when they get picked up. Um, but currently, every one of our districts is current is serving that need for us. Okay. And I just have to say, as a parent and as a board member, I'm so excited to see all of the growth in not only the unified sports programs, but the live unified programs that we now have with live unified movie night, um, which is a club to build collaboration and. Um, friendships among students with special needs and other students without special needs. Um, and I know we've done a lot with that in the last couple of years, so I just want to say kudos, um, Kevin, because I know you've helped work with some of that. So the last question, what support do your organizations need to be able to collaborate with other organizations? Is it communication or are there other things that you need as well? And everybody says money, I'm sure. I mean, I, I, I think that this conversation and just even the hosting of it is a fantastic start. Um, you know, anything that could bring, um, bring all of us in the room so we could have conversations. I'm, I'm personally leaving with a pretty extensive to-do list of people to follow up with and have follow-up conversations on all of these things. And, uh, you know, I, I I, um, I guess just, you know, I, I feel confident that there's going to be action taken by this. And so I don't know what that looks like ongoing, if there should be a, an annual meeting or what sort of system you put in place to um, continue to have stakeholders in the room, but this just feels like a, a great start. I would add, um, I do, I feel supported in collaborating. Um, I think maybe some goals, objectives, strategic, you know, st some strategy, a plan would be good, some structure. And, and to the public, if you're able to attend any of the fundraising, breakfast, lunches, auctions that all of these worthy groups have in our community, please don't write your check out in advance. Wait until you hear the lives that they have changed because then you'll write it for at least twice as much. That's the plan, right? Um, but I, I just want to thank all of you for being here and thank you for the amazing work that you do in our community. And now I'm going to turn it over to Chuck Namit for final comments. Appreciate your attendance. Um, under policy governance, goal three is uh, considered what we call critical thinkers and solution seekers. And you're a part of this. So our goal is to increase the percentage of students participating in at least one positive school activity as well as community-based activity. And certainly you've added to that as practitioners. Uh, to accomplish this goal, the district has enhanced effectiveness in district employees' uh, work, as well as uh, panel of practitioners uh, such as yourself, in interacting with the students. And the goal, again, was to prepare our students to be successful by providing formal school training, and we've talked about that, and professional learning opportunities. And the goal here, again, is to for students break down barriers and get cultural clues 
and cues as to what they're going to be doing in the future and promoting open, positive communication and student experience. At the community conversation which we're uh, involved with, I want to thank not only the parents but also community members as well as practitioners such as yourself in joining us in this effort. Now the next goal is for the board and the administration will take these notes that you've given us uh, on the cards and will examine the views and the board will take steps to introduce these changes and will enhance our district's program. So in closing, you know, it seems to be that when we educate children, it's not just the schools, it's the practitioners that need to be engaged and also families need to be really encouraged to support these students. So I guess I'd close it by stating this. On our wall, we have a rather interesting suggestion here. All students empowered for future readiness. And it seems to me that this is a community conversation that talks about together, stronger together for change. So again, thank you very much for, for being here. And thank you. The adage is to start on time and end early, which we are. <laughs>